So we've been talking about David. And if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We've been talking about David. And we've been focusing in particularly about, on David and Goliath. And nobody really talks about that story because David and Goliath really is a story that belongs in children's church. So we don't think that there's terribly much relevance for us. But actually, <clears throat> I think there are maybe some insights that we could lift and work to and add to our lives, add some value to us. So this is the third part of the series called Giants at the Gate. Giants at the Gate. God has got such an incredible plan for each one of your lives. And the more you get into God and the more you discover about God, the more you start to realize how expansive his plan is for your life and what he really wants to do. The thing about it is, in our working with God, he's looking for a co-laborer. You see, God, God trusted you so much that he gave you something that potentially was to his detriment. He gave you something called free will. So you have the prerogative to decide how you choose to live your life. And what the thing about it is in many situations, people have a look at it and what they ignore is the idea of having the prerogative to choose how you wanna live your life. So they look at God and they blame God for everything that happens in their life, unaware of the fact that the decisions that they've made very often have put them in places that they shouldn't be. But they elected to be there. Whether it was knowingly or out of ignorance, it was still a decision that put them in that place. God has given us free will. What he's looking for is, he says, I'm looking for people that will work with me, people who have an understanding of who I am, people who have the reality of what I'm about and a love for me that really bubbles up and excites who they are. It's something that motivates, invigorates, and directs their life. If that's the person that you are, he says, I want to get to know you. We can do some great stuff together. The throne of your life is your heart. What sits on the throne of your life owns your heart and governs your life. What sits on the throne of your life owns your heart and governs your life. God has called us to be people who rule and reign. What he's calling us to is he's calling us to a place where we recognize the fact that he has given us something called our life. And what he's really labeled our life is our kingdom. All of us have a kingdom. Your kingdom and what constitutes your kingdom is everything that's going on in your life. The emotions that fill your life, the people that fill your life, your career, your vocation, your interests, it, your children, your family, your, everything that is part of your life is part of your kingdom. And what God has said is, I've called you to reign and I've called you to rule. There is a difference between reigning and ruling. Reigning has to do with position. Ruling has to do with governance. What he's saying to you is, I want you to come to a reality and a, a, a realization of who you are in me. When you realize what Jesus has made available to you, when you realize all that he has given to you, it puts you in a position where you're able to govern effectively. You want to assume the position, but it's also a case of sitting saying, I need to act out of that and I need to govern my life. I need to govern everything that influences my kingdom. Very often what happens with many Christians is we're very happy and we love God and we celebrate God, but we have no boundaries in our life. We haven't established anything. So it's a free flow. Things flow into our kingdom and flow out of our kingdom and do this, that, and that. There is no governance in our life. We haven't come to a place where we understand the authority that, that God has given us, where he's sitting saying, rule and reign the kingdom. Don't just let things happen haphazardly. We wonder why things go on in our life and very often it's because we've never or we haven't stepped up to the plate and exercised the authority necessary to rule and reign in that situation. God speaks about the fact that when you were young, 
You did crazy things. You lived as a child, you lived out of innocence, and you lived in a little playground called your kingdom because you didn't know any better. But what he's saying is you're going to have to come to a place as you mature and as you grow up where the innocence of youth and the ignorance of youth we let go of and we grab hold of what it means to be a person who is a mature Christian in the kingdom. Because a mature Christian sits and says, fine, I understand that I have position and I understand that I have authority. I understand that God has put me in this place to govern this thing called my kingdom and I have responsibility for what's taking place right at the moment in this thing called my life. When David went up and he met with his brothers and Goliath came out and started taunting him, the, the army of Israel, David was the only one who immediately stood up and said, this is wrong. There is something in my kingdom that is out of order. The moment he stepped into that arena, the moment his brothers, who were part of his kingdom, found themselves on a battleground where they're standing with a giant taunting them, he had a look at the situation and he said, this is not right. There is something out of order in my kingdom and I'm going to bring in corrective action. I'm going to get rid of the giant. The point about it is this. In our lives, when we're going through life, if we are sensitive and we're aware of our position and we're always reigning and ruling, we're aware of the boundaries of our life. And when things come into the kingdom that shouldn't be there, there is an alert that goes off and sudden we sit and say, something's out of order here. We need to make some changes. We need to go kill a giant. We need to get something out of the kingdom. But we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of it. Not only was he aware of it, but he was so confident in and of himself, he wants to run out and kill Goliath then and there. It's everybody around him. He says, no, David, you can't do that now. You need to go off, David. You need to go and you, you, you need to go and see the king. When you have things established in your life, in your heart that are of God, it gives you an understanding and a disposition where you're able to view your kingdom through kingdom eyes. You're able to see things the way that God sees them. And so as a result of that, it puts you in a place where you're not only able to assess what should be and should not be in your kingdom, but it also gives you the authority to sit and say, I'm gonna bring about the necessary changes to make sure that things change. We're about change. Christianity is about empowerment. Christianity is not just a little praise and worship celebration on a Sunday morning. Christianity is a power play. It's something that's going on that affects your life. Christians should be very different to the world because the thing is what we have is we have something established on the inside of us called Him. And He is the empowerment and everything we need to bring about change. It's not to say you're not going to have challenges. You will have challenges. Everybody has challenges. Life is full of challenges. The question is when Goliath stands up, what do you do? The army ran away. So it's only David, the boy, who stands there. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, it says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. We are in a position where we are either being influenced by our world or we're living out of the confidence of influencing our world. One of the two is taking place all the time. God has called you to be an influencer. God has equipped you to be an influencer. God has equipped you to rule and reign in your life. And when we step up to the position of ruling and reigning, we are people who govern our life effectively and we recognize the fact that my position is to bring about change so that the model of heaven should come and be evident in my kingdom. That's what it's about. But there are too many Christians who sit in apathy and what ends up happening is rather than influencing their world, they let their world influence them. And when you let your world influence you, you're at the mercy of what's going on outside of you. You're at the mercy of the giants. 
There are people who sit and say, you know what, I'm just sorry that I've got such a bad temper, but it's just the way that it is. The temper is what it is. And so when the temper's on the throne, I can behave any way that I like, and I can scream and shout and carry on and throw profanities and fingers and this and that and all the rest of it and carry on like a banshee because the temper's on the throne. What ended up happening? You gave away your authority and you abdicated the throne. And all of a sudden, you've got a temper sitting on the throne of your life and your temper is dictating to you what's gonna happen. Anything that you put in power on the throne of your life is gonna give direction to you, the citizen, as to how you're gonna live. When you abdicate, and when, when you get rid of, when you hand over, when you release the power that God has given to you, for authority in your life, when you sit and step out of the role as being the one who should be bringing about the change and ruling and reigning, and you hand that over to something else, you put yourself in a place where you are subject to what you've just put in place as king. There are too many Christians walking around who have illicit kings running their kingdoms. We're no different to anybody else in the world. Why? Because we haven't exercised our authority. Everybody in the world is like, okay, well, I just feel like behaving like a banshee. Okay, fine. They have nothing to change it. They do not have the authority that God has given them. What they have is, they have three key points to how I manage my behavior. And they try really hard, but you put them in the right environment and it all comes out again because it can't change. Jesus said, I want to change who you are. And fundamentally, you need to be a new person. You need to be a person who rules and reigns. Don't abdicate the throne. Don't let go of the thing inside of your life that directs who you are and what you're all about. Because when you release it, you're the one who gave it away. You're the only one who can get it back. We don't have the prerogative to behave any way we like. Anytime that we do not have the truth of God established inside of our heart, we are vulnerable to a coup in our kingdom. Anytime you do not have the power established on the inside of you and the truth of what he is and what he said to you in a particular area of your life, you are vulnerable to a coup. You are vulnerable to something else coming into your life and telling you how you should feel or how you should think. And the moment you surrender your authority to that, you've just given it the throne. We need to start taking back some thrones in our lives. We need to grab hold of some stuff. Because if we don't, our Christianity is nothing more than a theory. This is where Christianity gets practical. David stands there and David looks at the giant and he starts telling the giant, this is what's gonna happen. L buddy, let me give you uh, your notice. I'm just letting you know, this is what's coming. Number one, I don't care what you've got. You can bring your javelin, your spear, you can intimidate me any way you like, but I want you to know something. What I have equipped on the inside of me and what's established on the inside of me is not only going to kill you, but when it's finished, I'm coming over to cut your head off. What comes out of your mouth in the moment of pressure? What comes out of your mouth when your husband carries on like a lunatic and all the rest of it, and now you have to decide how you're gonna to respond to that? What happens when you're in the... <laughs> What happens when you're in the thick of something, when somebody says to you, oh, by the way, let me just tell you something that you're overdrawn by this amount. What comes out of your mouth? What happens when somebody says, oh, by the way, we don't need you here anymore. Thanks so much for coming. Here's the pink slip. You start to discover the first thing that comes out of your mouth is gonna give you an idea of what's established in your heart. The problem with it is people like for all that stuff to simmer down and then they come into church and they go, oh, and they say, Father, I just thank you that you are my supply and you just give me everything and I thank you my steps are ordered and glory. Has. That's not what came out of your mouth. <laughs> That's what's in your head. 
And so when you come into church, you speak about what's in your head because it sounds really good, but what came out of your heart was what's truly in there. I don't know how we're going to make this, and I don't know how we're going to get it, and it's like I've got bills to pay, and the mortgage is due, and then we've got the light bills, and then what happened? The truth of what's established on the inside of you came out. The truth that what was, of what was established on the inside of David came out, and he said, Goliath, you're dying. You did. What comes out of your mouth? It's important because what it says to you is it's telling you your words are, are a commentary on the balance book of your heart. It's telling you what is established on the inside of you. When you don't have the things of him established on the inside of you, you're not equipped for the battle. Part of the problem with it is, and the reason that so many Christians struggle with things is because they know all the stuff up here, they know all the words, they know all the scriptures, but it's not in here. So what ends up happening is there is a disconnect because I'm going into battle unarmed, hoping for the best. It's what's established in your heart that equips you to deal with life. It's what's established in your heart that, em that is empowered, that sits on the throne, that gives you what you need to make things happen, to make things change in your life. Part of the problem with it is Christians don't know, is it in my head or in my heart? I don't know which one of the two it is. Watch what comes out of your mouth. From the abundance of the? The mouth speaks. What is he saying to you? If you don't know the difference between the heart and the head, listen what comes out spontaneously. What comes out spontaneously is coming out of here. It'll tell you exactly what's inside there. And if the right thing comes out of there, you know what you're established in and you live in the expectation of change and transformation. If it's not inside there, then we need to make some changes because I need to get something established on the inside of me. If what comes out of my mouth is not of that, how do I change it so that I can change what's established in my heart? Change your relationships. Change your relationships. What you spend time relating to is given access to your heart and it's given permission to make deposits. Oh, well, you know, I just known them for so long, you know, but what they said just really, really hurt me. I'm so offended by it. Be careful, because if you take the offense and you get into relationship with the offense, what ends up happening when I'm in relationship with something, I spend time with it, and I think about it, and I invest it, and I develop intimacy with what I'm in relationship with because I'm spending so much time with how hurt I am and how offended I am and how my li life is just and that's, I do all and I work so really hard and they don't appreciate me. And, then, and what ends up happening? You make your heart vulnerable and accessible to what you're in relationship with. And the next thing, hurt, offense, comes along and drops something called bitterness into your heart. And suddenly I've got bitterness on the inside. And the next time I see that person, the way that I respond to them is out of the bitterness that's been established inside of my heart. And so what, what comes out of me is based on the bitterness inside of me. Have you ever noticed when you do that, that that person can never do anything right? Did you see the way she said hello to me? Did you see that? Did you hear that tone? Because what you spend relationship with and what you spend time in, what, you make, what you're intimate with, you give access to your heart. And when it has access to your heart, it makes deposits in your life. And the deposits that are made into your heart are the things that get established and we live out of those things. Relationships are one of the most important influences of our heart. God created it that way. What you're in relationship with has access and permission. It has access to and permission to make deposits into your heart. 
I used this example before, but it's a very important one. We talk about relationship. Why is relationship so important? Relationship is important because the things that affect our heart, the languaging of our heart, the things that, that influence and bring about change inside of our heart are not words. We think it's words. Words affect our understanding. But the heart affected by language that is very different to words. It's affected by messaging. It's affected by emotion. It's affected by other considerations that go well beyond words. Let me give you an example. When Vivian comes home and I hold her hands and I say, Vivi, tell me about how school was today. Talk to her. And she starts telling me about how her day was and how she did this and how she did that. And I listen to what she's telling me. And I look in her eyes and she's talking about and I get so excited about it. And, and I, I ask her about this and she tells me about that and she's present and we laugh and we chat. And what's happening? I'm spending time with her. But the messaging that's going to her heart is, he cares for me. The messaging that's going to her heart is, he's interested in me. The messaging that's going to her heart is, he loves me. I am safe. So what happens? Because the messaging that's going to your heart is establishing something on the inside of her, what ends up happening is when I get into a situation where I say to her, Vivi, you know what? I'm coming to collect you from school tomorrow. She gets so excited. And in the morning she says, bye dad, I'll see you later. And she goes to school and she tells her teacher, my dad's coming to collect me. And she tells all of her friends, dad's coming to get. She's, how does she know? She hasn't seen me. I'm not parked outside. How does she know I'm going to be there? Because of what's established in her heart. She has a confidence on what's been established on the inside of her. And she knows if dad said that, dad will be true to his word. Dad will deliver because I trust him and he loves me. Yeah. Kathy's such a nice person. But if I said to Vivian, Vivian, you know what? You can trust Kathy. Kathy is a nice person. Kathy is an honest person and she's upright. Kathy is a person, if she said she's going to do something, she will do it. She's promised me that she will come and she will collect you tomorrow. Is that okay? And she'll go, okay, because I told her. But the whole of the next day, she'll be wondering, is she really going to be there or isn't she? I hope she's going to be there. My dad said she'd be there. I think she'll be there, but I don't really know that she's going to be there. Why? Because she knows about Kathy and she knows good things about Kathy, but she has nothing of Kathy established in her heart. What's the point? The point is faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes as a result of what is established in your heart. Too many Christians want to go about listen, listening to the words of the Bible. The words speak to your head. The words say God is good. God will protect you. God, God is, is the one who will provide for you. God will order your steps. God, it tells you all, everything that it's telling you is true. But it's feeding your head unless you're in relationship. The whole point about relationship is that the Bible should open up possibilities to you and show you more of the dimensions of what God is all about. But it's built on relationship. If you don't have relationship with God, it's no point knowing a whole bunch of stuff about God up here because your confidence comes from your heart. If you have no relationship, you have nothing established on the inside of you that you can use when you walk into battle, when you walk into situations where you need to bring about change and transformation. We think faith is something that we conjure up in order to get something from God. I need to have faith so that I can get something from God. But that's not what faith is. Faith is the evidence that God has established himself in me. Faith is the evidence that God has established himself in me. When I have him established inside of who I am and I know him and he says, you know what? I just love you so much. If he says to me, this is what I'm going to do for you. 
I trust it. Why? Because my heart is established in Him. It's established in trust. It's established in relationship. It's not in the head. You still sound very serious. This is good stuff. This is what will change your life. What I'm trying to show you is why so many Christians struggle. Because they're well-intentioned and they do good things and they get into studying the Bible and they have a lot of knowledge about the Bible. But unless you have relationship, you really have nothing. You see, the Bible is an attempt to take a relationship and portray it in words. That's really what the Bible is. But it's not a substitute for relationship. It's supposed to be something that opens up opportunity and brings about change. Because what happens is when, the Holy, when you read something in the Bible and you rely on the Holy Spirit to take that and for the Holy Spirit to open up that truth to you, what you're doing is you're moving into an area of revelation as opposed to an area of knowledge. Knowledge feeds the head. God wants me happy. But you don't have anything established in your heart where you sit and say, I'm God, I know that that's the pathway that God has designed for me. It's our role as priest when we come into relationship with God and we spend time out of relationship with God that equips us to walk into the position of king. But it is the role of king that changes our life. You see, the role of priest is all about relationship. It's all about me in relationship with him and being able to take that in relationship with you. But that empowers me to step into the role of king. The role of king is all about exercising authority. It's all about bringing about change and transformation in my life. Um, just give me a moment. I'm just, I've got to edit a little bit here. You know, the things that we give access to our heart are the things that change us and we're not always aware of the fact that we actually make ourselves vulnerable to influences in our lives. It was interesting yesterday because we had a situation where Colton, I, mean, I always tell you, he loves his football, but for a long time he's always played defensively and he's enjoyed playing defensively because he likes defense and he loves going out and he loves tackling. He's small, but he loves tackling. I don't know, get figure. He, he likes to hit. But the thing is, last season he got to a place where he wanted to start playing more offensively. And so they put him in that role and he did really well. You know, he's shorter, he's stocky, but he's fast and he's a good catcher. So he was perfect because what they did is he ran down the line, they threw the ball to him, he was great at catching, and he could convert it to a touchdown. And he loved that. He had so much fun. And this year it's been really difficult because he's got on there and this team he's been with for a number of years and they almost have in their heads, they've pegged him in a defensive role. So trying to see him in the other role is like they haven't come around to that. It's, they like him there. But every now and again, again, they give him the opportunity to play offensively. But he usually gets one turn in the whole game. And the problem with it is they've been playing the same play. So what happens is, the guy, what does he do? He hikes the ball. What does he do? <laughs> Who catches? He catches the ball, the quarterback. And Colton's standing right there. And Colton, and so now, this is their play now. Colton's like, okay, why do I have to stand so close for you to throw the ball to me, first of all? Why well, can't run down the field? He hasn't right got. But th then the quarterback takes the ball, and he looks at him like this, and everybody's watching him. So it's already predictable, and then he goes. So Colton's over here, and he catches the ball, 
And it's a bit late because everybody's read the play and there are four players on him already. So he never gets a chance to run. So he came home yesterday and he said to Sarah, he said, you know, he said, I've been thinking. I don't actually think I'm really very fast. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, that's so typical. The situations of our lives always set up opportunities for thought to come into our minds. And when a thought comes into our mind, we have to think about what we do with that. Because all too often, it's very easy for us to sit and spend time meditating in relationship with the thought. And then what ends up happening is before you know it, you find yourself in a place where your heart is open and accessible and it's making deposits in your life that actually you're not a good athlete and you're not a good footballer and you're not an and before you know it, that's what you live out of it because it's been established in your heart. Your heart is reserved for one thing and one thing only. And as a person who reigns and rules, it's your responsibility to make sure that nothing else gets into your heart except the things of the Father. Your heart is reserved for Him. This is the challenge. Say, the challenge is me. I knew it. You're right. <laughs> Out of your own mouth, you said it. <laughs> this is the challenge. The throne of your life is your heart. What sits on the throne owns your heart. What owns your heart governs your life. Your heart belongs to God. When we walk through life, we are spend our lives synthesizing our environment, the people in our environment, our situations, what's going on, the news we're hearing, the newspapers we're reading. We're synthesizing all of this stuff, and it's all coming into me. And I'm trying to understand part of it, and I'm developing opinions about it, and I've got ideas about it, and I believe this, and I feel that, and my emotions get involved in this, that, and the next thing. Everything that you have in that context has come out of your environment. When you're facing a giant, the question is, who is sitting on the throne of your life? Because the, th the thing that's most important, you have, you have two important relationships. One of the two of them is probably sitting on the throne. It's either God or it's you. You see, when we sit on the throne of our life, what we do is, we sitting, what we're saying is, I value my opinion, I value my understanding, I value my emotion more. And so I spend time in relationship with that. And when I spend time in relationship what I'm, with what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and what I believe, what I'm doing is I'm giving myself access to my heart. That's why so many Christians act out of what they believe, what I feel, what I think, because that's established on the inside of them. As opposed to what God said is, you know what? The heart is reserved for me. When we get into relationship with him, what he does is he starts to show us parts and dimensions of who he is and what he's all about. And when he comes and he establishes himself on the inside of us, what he brings with him is liberation. What he brings with him is freedom. What he brings with him is opportunity. What he brings with him is potential. What he brings is the opportunity for you to step into a dimension of living that you've never had before. As long as you're on the throne, you're going to tell yourself how big the giant is and how small you are. You're going to focus on how you don't have the ability, you don't have the equipping, you don't have the education, you don't have the wherewithal, you don't have the content, you don't have the money. You don't. It's all, as long as you're on the throne, you never, your life will not move. Until you're able to get to a place where we manage my life and I sit and say what's going to bring about change in my life is the father on the throne nothing really happens. I want it to happen. I'm excited about potentially what could happen, but it doesn't happen. Who's sitting on the throne of your life? We have a responsibility to govern this thing called our kingdom. 
That's a fabulous responsibility. It's not a bad thing. Christians want to know how to change their life. Exercise your authority. Stop letting emotions come in and behaving any way you like. Stop it. You're abdicating the throne. Stop just doing anything that you feel like doing. Or stop, well, I just think I should do this. Why are you doing it? Where did it come from? Manage the throne of your life. It's a sacred place that belongs to him. And when he's established on the inside of you, it'll change your life. It'll walk you into freedom and it'll empower you to walk into a dimension of experience that you've never known before. But it's birthed out of the heart. It's not birthed out of the head. Christians can sound really good, but they're disempowered. I heard a, an interesting quotation this week. They were talking about Christians and they said one of the biggest challenges that they have is that Christians are heavenly interested but earthly useless. Can we please stand? Use this week to do an audit on your kingdom. Get into your kingdom and make some changes this week. See who's sitting on the throne. See, who's, see what's sitting on the throne. And if you need to make some changes, take back the authority. Put yourself back on the throne. Put him back on the throne. Get it off the throne. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness to us. We just want to thank you, Father, that everything that you've given us, all the potential for life, everything that you want us to step into, the dimension of experience and encounter is all as a result of a relationship based on intimacy with you. An intimate relationship established inside of who we are in our heart. We thank you, Father, that it's so liberating, that it's so freeing. We thank you that it brings up and opens up opportunity and potential that we've never walked in. We thank you, Father, that it's empowering. It makes us realize I don't always have to be subject to how I feel. I don't always have to be subject to what I think. I don't have to be subject to the giants in my world. We bless you for it now. I thank you for this week that lies ahead. I want to thank you that it's going to be a week of discovery. I thank you, Father, it's going to be a week of war. There's going to be a few giant slayings this week. Yes. 